our first speaker today is somebody that I have only known of by reputation. Uh, he's, a, he's a bit of a legend in, uh, in the called circles, of course. He has been arrested or jailed over a dozen times for activities that in what we would consider a freer or in some places a more normal state would be considered activities that would be considered patriotic, fulfilling a duty, and virtuous. But <clears throat> for him, they've been a significant loss of freedom on many occasions. Uh, he was first blooded when he was fired from his university post in 1992 for speaking out for democracy. Uh, he has been sued multiple times and eventually declared bankrupt, which meant he could not travel. He could no longer stand for election, as he had in his native country. Uh, in 2012, the bankruptcy was finally annulled, which means that he can stand for election in, upcoming, uh, in the upcoming elections in his native country, which is Singapore. When he walked into the room today, somebody from my world, uh, Emily Lau, one of the, the giants of democracy in Hong Kong, she looked over at him and she smiled and reached out her hand and greeted this man like an old friend. And then I knew that, you know, by reputation he was one to respect, but if Emily Lau says he's a good guy, then he is a very good guy. <laughs> Everybody from Cal knows who I'm talking about. It's Dr. Chi Sun Juan. Please help me welcome. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. I, I feel eminently qualified to speak on this topic, not because I bring any degree of expertise to this area, but only because my country pays a lot of attention to economic growth and apparently uh, almost nothing on reducing income and inequality. Time is of the essence, so I will come straight to the point. I wrote a piece for CNN, which was published yesterday, about the problems of inequality and lack of opportunity for the younger generations in Hong Kong and Singapore that are fueling unhappiness among the people. I will repeat what I've written, except to say that without democracy, policies in both cities have become skewed to benefit those at the top of the economic chain, leaving the middle and low classes to struggle. Both Hong Kong and Singapore have one of the highest income inequalities in advanced economies. And yet, in Singapore at least, there is no minimum wage. According to some estimates, Singapore has the highest number of millionaires per capita. And yet, about 5% of our workforce draw an annual income of less than 5,000 US dollars a year. And it's just not the lower income workers who are getting harmed. The middle class Greece is as prevalent as ever. A recent study showed that nearly half of Singaporeans are subsisting from paycheck to paycheck, saving less than 10% of their monthly income. Public housing has become so expensive that young couples find it hard to afford. Recently, the government has taken the discouraging youths from getting a university education because of limited job opportunities. We also have a broken pension savings scheme called the Central Provident Fund, with an entire generation of retirees in danger of having no livable income. The only reason that you don't see the occupied protest in Singapore is because the government continues to crack down on the public land. In Singapore's case, there is another pernicious effect of an autocratic system that has stifled innovation and risk-taking culture, leaving our economy unable to generate itself, to regenerate itself, and having to depend on foreigners to stimulate growth. Singapore's economic outlook cannot by any stretch of the imagination, be said to be bright, lacking in what entrepreneurs call creative destruction. Our economy is unable to reinvigorate itself. Is a surprise. In their book, Why Nations Fail, economists Darren S. Mogu and James Robinson explain why some countries are able to regenerate, while others wither 
and die. Esimo Bloom and Robinson demonstrate that economic and political institutions are key players in determining the fate of nature. Extracted political and economic institutions, ones that concentrate power in the hands of a few, and extract resources from the many for the few, cause states to will. Inclusive institutions, on the other hand, ones that practice plurality and encourage innovation, allow states to sustain economic growth and progress. Politically extractive institutions by the nature are intolerant of open criticism and dissenting views. This creates an unbridgeable dissonance with the economy because it is disagreement and dissent which are the very elements that are necessary for creative destruction. Absent such open and indeed noisy mix of views and counter views, economies cannot reinvigorate themselves. Singapore's is, unfortunately, a system that is averse to the ways of creative destruction. Steve Wozniak, the other half behind Apple, said that Singapore could not produce a company like Apple because the system has destroyed creative elements that give rise to innovative companies. Indeed, this seems to be the case in the last decade or so. Our labor productivity is languishing, and no matter how much money we throw at it, we cannot seem to get it to elevate. Indeed, we have had to depend on mass importation of foreigners to try to augment our productivity, productivity levels. Ironically, and perhaps unwittingly, it was considered on you, the country's first prime minister and currently the senior statesman, who in a stunning admission said, that, quote, without foreigners, the jobs will not be there to begin with, unquote. Now, mind you, this, in spite of more than half a century of uninterrupted rule by one party. This did not occur just recently. It took years, even decades, for the rock to set in. And all this time, Western leaders, both in the economic and political spheres, have continued to disregard the lack of democracy and the abuse of human rights in Singapore in favor of trade and commerce. For many years, human rights was a dirty term. It was taboo to speak of it, much less fight for it. And because of this, what has not been addressed or addressed nearly enough is the topic of free trade without freedom. In 2003, Singapore signed a free trade agreement with the U.S. It's first of the kind. At that time, the agreement was touted as a job creator, and the world needed more, not less free trade. I wasn't so sanguine. I visited the U.S. at that time and spoke up on the matter, pointing out that without clauses to guarantee human rights and rights of workers, the trade pact would just help the business leaders both countries to exploit cheap labor. Of course, given the might of the corporate interests in the US, I couldn't get any word edgewise. That was 2003. Ten years have passed since, since, and the FTA has had many years to work its affairs. In 2011, the US ambassador to Singapore, Mr. David Edelman, said, the agreement with Singapore is perhaps our most successful FTA tool. I have no doubt that the FTA is successful. The question is, for whom? According to the ILO, the International Labour Organization, Singaporean workers work the most number of hours and yet see their real incomes diminish. Several surveys have shown Singaporean workers being the most stressed out and the unhappiest in Asia. This is in conjunction with everything I mentioned earlier, income inequality, Singapore being the most expensive city in the world, according to the Economist Intelligence Unit, and limited opportunities for the younger generation and so on. I understand the importance of free trade. I get it. Without trade, the modern world comes to a standstill. I also understand that in perfect world, no one expects perfect equality. There is truth 
that inequality in wealth and income is inevitable and a measure of inequality spurs diligence and entrepreneurship and therefore economic progress. But extreme in income inequality does not conduce to society's well-being. If we are to ensure that trade remains sustainable, then we must strive to make trade pacts beneficial for all. And I mean from the mightiest of CEOs to the lowliest of your workers. The European Union is about to sign its, its own free trade agreement with Singapore. The EU Singapore Free Trade Agreement, I understand, makes extensive provisions for businesses. But there is no commitment to ensure that the interests of the ordinary folk and their rights are protected. I will repeat here what I said about the US and Singapore free trade agreement. Without freedoms, there can be no free trade. Without democracy, there can be no workers' rights. And without workers' rights, there is only exploitation. Let history not repeat itself. Only now with Europeans joining in with the Americans to exploit Singaporeans and others in the region. Let not history remark that the liberals did not have the foresight to see that the EU Singapore Free Trade Agreement in its current form is not viable. Instead, let us have the courage, the compassion, and the conviction to do what is right just what makes us rich. In this regard, I ask our friends in all day to look into this matter because you are uniquely positioned to impact on the impending FTA and salvage a system that, if not rectified, will harm rather than help liberalism and all that it stands for. No one is under the illusion that democracy is a panacea to all the ills of society. I don't think that's the reason protesters are so doggedly and valiantly occupied the streets of central Hong Kong. They know that it is the decisions that we make as members of the community that determine how we live and what we make of life. That, in essence, ladies and gentlemen, is free. Hong Kong and Singapore are the cusp of something momentous. Shrink from the challenge, and we will rule the moment. Rise to it. We will take our cities towards greater strength. And I dare say, lead the Asian continent to genuine greatness. Greatness not because we have just riches, but because the people have rights. Not because we are clever, but because we have compassion. And most certainly, not just because we are worldly, but because we are wise. To this historic end, what role will liberals and Democrats play? Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chi. Um, I'd like to introduce now somebody from a little bit closer to home, a little bit closer to my universe, uh, and somebody who's actually very close to me personally. Uh, last night, this gentleman stood up on this stage uh, for the 10th year anniversary of the Lion Rock Institute, which is an independent free market think tank in Hong Kong. Uh, 10 years ago, he was approached by three slightly wild young men uh, who decided that they needed somebody a little bit older and a little bit wider to provide some guidance and Mr. The, uh, the next speaker agreed to be that person. He has been the chairman of the Lion Rock Institute since its inception. For 10 years, he started developing uh, and promoting ideas around economic freedoms much earlier than that. It is native Australia. Uh, his, his day job and as a successful uh, career professional in finance has not stopped him from engaging in the world of ideas. So please help me welcome a very dear and old friend of mine, Mr. Bill Stacey, Chairman of the Lion Rock. Um, thank you very much, Andrew, and, um, and welcome to people from uh, outside Hong Kong to Hong Kong. Welcome to 
the people from uh, Carl's to the uh, Lion Rock and, um, and EFN um, event. I have an admission to make, um, while some of us are liberals and Democrats, I'm an imperialist. Um, that comes about because I'm an economist, and, but I'm the sort of economist that is an imperial economist and likes to expand my um, uh, realm of comment and knowledge to all sorts of other disciplines. And, and, and Andrew referred to some of the sort of lions of the liberal movement uh, earlier, and, and one of them who I think we should remember today um, passed away last Monday, that is, um, uh, the Monday just passed, Gordon Tulloch. And Gordon Tulloch was um, one of the founders of, of the theory of public choice, which was um, really with uh, Buchanan expanding the realm of economics very much into public policy and decision-making and constitutions and how they're formed. And Gordon Tulloch's a particularly interesting person um, to think about you know, here today and in Hong Kong in this event for reasons that I only discovered when reading obituaries, which is sad. He was fluent in Chinese um, and had an encyclopedic knowledge of Chinese history, much of which he gained as a serviceman around the time of World War II. He also would have fitted in well in some legislatures, and someone writing an obituary said about him that he came from an era that had an attitude that people are supposed to show their appreciation of each other by insulting each other. Um, with one, the one with the best insult winning. Most people simply viewed his insults um, as uh, untimely, and they did not realize that he was actually complimenting them um, if he was insulting you. And that what you were supposed to do was insult him back. Um, those he really looked down upon, he simply ignored. So if in any of the comments that we make today, um, insults are to be taken as the highest of compliments. Um, the people who genuinely believe in freedom um, and in liberty and those who are active in trying to create in their country's liberty will um, disagree on many things. That is the whole point, isn't it? That we want the ability to disagree, to think about um, the key and important issues that uh, shape the world that we live in. Freedom is indeed about um, disagreement and the ability to insult each other. Um, I, I was reminded by the last speaker with regard to Singapore about you know, the dilemma uh, of sort of corporate interests and freedom. And I was rather naughty once when a guest of Standard Chartered Bank in Singapore, they had uh, the head of Singapore Press, I can't recall if it was the chairman or chief executive, I think the chief executive, as a guest, and he gave the spiel about what a wonderful place Singapore is. And, and I like Singapore, there are many good things about it. And, and I asked a cheeky question, I said, you know, you just gave a great speech and you said that you believe in uh, freedom, Singapore is very free, but um, you have capital punishment and you sue the people who uh, um, express different political views and use litigation um, by officers of the state in uh, a fairly aggressive way and you ban the Far Eastern Economic Review. Um, and he said to me in response, thank you for your question, I too am a liberal and someday capital punishment will change in Singapore. As for the issue of litigation, people know what they should be saying. And you don't need to be sued if you say the right things. And as for the Far Eastern Economic Review, the editor is just childish. Um, now fortunately, another corporate interest has protected that editor, and he is the opinion page um, uh, editor of the Asian Wall Street Journal here in Hong Kong today. Um, and I think it is important that uh, many of our corporate titans um, genuinely do believe in freedom and have fought very hard to achieve that. Um, I'm particularly pleased that uh, we'll be joined by people like Emily Lau addressing us very soon. Um, when I first moved from Australia to Hong Kong 20 years ago, one thing that really stood out in Hong Kong was the number of um, influential, strong, opinionated women in public life. One was Emily Lau, another Christine Wo, another Anson Chan. Um, two of those have in common a background at Roman Catholic schools. Um, and uh, I thought this was good. I decided to marry someone from the same school as Anson Chan. <laughs> um, but this was different to Australia. And so my point is that in practice, Hong Kong has achieved great freedom for many of its people and opportunity 
for many of its people. Um, and we shouldn't just stop with what we have. Clearly, the efforts of others to continue to preserve freedom in Hong Kong are very important. And to do that, we need to make sure that we preserve and grow and develop the institutions that we have. And so I referred earlier to public choice theory, which reminds us of the importance of decentralizing power, of constitutionalism and checks on power. And whilst we all agree on freedom, I think we can have a useful debate about what the constraints and the institutions are best that will preserve that. And, and you know, those of us that are um, on the free market liberal um, side of the debate, debate focus very much on individuals, bottom up and choice, and maximize the realm of choice for those individuals in ideas, um, in personal liberties, in policy, and in economics. Um, and the outcomes of the choices that those individuals make um, are, uh, are critical, um, and, uh, and we should allow those outcomes um, to, uh, to be what they are, where the cards um, might lay. Um, sometimes irrespective of whether that delivers um, a quality of wealth or not. So I think we believe in um, inequality, we believe in, stop, equality, um, to, um, uh, to create um, your own life, your own wealth, your own prosperity. Um, and the idea of who has the most money is one of the most narrow parts of the debate about, um, about equality. So um, thank you all very much for coming here um, today. I hope we can have a continuing and constructive debate. Um, and, uh, uh, and thank you for your efforts uh, on behalf of freedom. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, we now head uh, now we, we now head to Europe uh, and, and take to look to take a lesson from there. We are going to be inviting the former Commissioner for Human Rights for Germany. Uh, he's been involved with the Free Democratic Party of Germany, which of course is inextricably linked to the Friedrich Naumann Foundation. Uh, he is the Vice President of Liberal International, and this year he founded Nonig Human Rights and Responsible Business. He's worked in over seventy countries uh, with governments that promote liberal ideas. So please help me welcome the Honorable. Marcus Nonig. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it's great to be here. It's very exciting when you're coming to this part of the world, coming from Europe. I spent a few days in Manila with uh, our friend Jules Martin and to see the growth and the excitement of the growth that's happening in, in Manila, in Hong Kong, in many, many other places of this part of the, of the world. It's very exciting to the European. And it's something that we don't have in that, in that extent. Although I'm from Berlin, where a lot of things are changing, but still, this is very special and it's very exciting. So I'd like to just say a few words on the two topics, and then at the end come back to what Bill was saying about being an imperialist. <laughs> I thought, what are you saying? And I thought, no, in the sense you were pointing it out for being an economist and trying to expand your ideas to all other streets of life, I would also claim to be an imperialist for the world of human rights, because I believe we should extend human rights ideas to all streets of life and to all uh, streets of politics. And I'll come back to that towards the end. So let me just uh, say a few words on promoting growth and on inequality. Yes, I think. There's no question that we want to promote growth. But we should think what we mean when we're asking for growth. We restrain ourselves to economic growth, which is important. There's no question. If we want to fight poverty, if we want to open up opportunities and chances to people, we need economic growth. There's no question about that. But as liberals, we shouldn't restrain ourselves to economic growth. We should think about growth in technology, growth in science. We should be courageous to walk new ways, to find new ways to explore the unknown, to have growth in knowledge and the growth in technology. 
And we shouldn't be scared of what's coming. We should explore it. We should see what the opportunities of new technologies can be as we are now in the middle of the, uh, the beginning of the digital age. Tremendous opportunities are there. But we should also, of course, look at the problems that that happened. In. As it was, we should make sure that privacy is respected in the digital age. But that shouldn't make us stop the development of these new technologies. It should make us think of how we can get together the growth and the profit of these new, new technologies, the personal profit that we can all have, the way to find a better life, and at the same time protect the individual. So I believe it's important that we expand what we understand when we're talking about growth. When we think of technology, that we think of education, that we think of personal growth, that we think of, of all sorts of growth that can make people live a better life. Secondly, I would like to just make a few remarks on inequality. When I first saw this motto, I thought, why am I attending a, a, a conference of liberals talking or addressing the issue of inequality? I'm not a social democrat, I'm not a socialist, because those are the guys that are debating the, the case of inequality in my country. And what they basically mean is we should reduce everybody to a medium same sort of style of life and income and everything. And we should make everyone more or less the same. Same income, same knowledge, same education, the same style of life. So that's the way this is discussed in my country. And I don't agree with that. That's not what I want. I think people are different. It's not a question. Each and every one of us is an individual came with his own history, with what he knows, with his own genetic code, with his own family background. We're all different. And it's great to be different. So, inequality is an issue. And I don't want, if, if you say reducing inequality, you put a question mark behind it. I was no and yes. I don't want differences between individuals to be wiped out or washed away. And to be honest, as you were addressing rich people, I don't mind people being rich. That's nice for them. But actually, I do mind if people are poor. And I do mind if they don't have a chance to change that. And I do mind a society where some people are rich but don't pay their share in a society or to the communities that have has given them the opportunity to become rich. Rich people should pay taxes. If they run businesses, they should pay their people decent wages because it's their workers that create their wealth. I think we must, as liberals, ask the question, where are responsibilities linked to these things? And I don't think there are easy answers to that. I think these are answers that are difficult. Because, of course, inequality can be something that pushes people, makes people ambitious. But at the same time, we must make sure that uh, we don't, uh, as they will say, okay, inequality is a good thing as such. We should never say that. We should always say there can be inequalities, there can be differences between people. But a truly liberal society will always make sure that each and every one has the same chances to build their own lives. And there should be no difference in that sense of inequality. There should be no difference in the way that the laws regarding to the individual. Each and every citizen has a right to address the court, address the police. Each and every citizen should be equal before the law. That is the reality of life where we cannot accept. The chances in uh, education should be there for everybody. And everybody should have the same chances to attend school, to attend the best possible school for him or her personally. Each and everybody should have the chance to attend university to the best of their personal capabilities and capacities. And these are things that a liberal society must ensure. So in that sense, I am completely against inequality. And I think it is a task for liberals to fight inequality. We need 
an equality of chances for individuals. So ladies and gentlemen, let me as a third point come back to what you have been uh, addressing though, and that's the idea of what do corporate leaders have to do with freedom and these kind of questions. And I would extend the responsibility also to political leaders. I think it's good that if we as a uh, free countries promote democracy and promote rule of law. I think there's a moral obligation if you're in a free country you can speak up. And whenever I think of my friends that are a bit more on the other side of uh, in the same country but in the other system, let me put it that way, I think that it means a lot to them if people from free countries come to visit them or speak up on their behalf. And we should keep on doing that. So there's a moral obligation to speak up for freedom, for human rights, and democracy. But we should go beyond that, and that is where I believe corporate leaders and democratic leaders come in, political leaders come in. We should also stand up and say, democracy and the rule of law is in our interest. There's a business interest in having the rule of law. There's a political interest in having democratic states, because it means less conflict, it means less inequality, it is something that makes the world a better place. A better place for business, a better place for life, and I believe we should make that step. I know that in the European debate it's not very nice to talk about human rights being in your interest, because people say no, it's the world. No. I believe it is, we have the moral grounds to be in favor of human rights and democracy, but we also have interest, we have an interest in the spread of democracy. So that's a point that we should make more and more. So, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I believe we're here, we're here in the middle of a fantastic region with fantastic world, with exciting possibilities, but also with the challenge of liberal ideas by quite a few authoritarian systems and we should challenge them. If they challenge us, our ideas of freedom and democracy, of protection of the individual, we should speak back to them, we should argue in favor of individual freedom, because that is why we're calling ourselves liberals, and that's why we're here. Thank you very much. Dr. Sean Hilodek. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, yesterday I met our next speaker and he was sporting a yellow ribbon. And for those of you who have been in town for a couple of days, you might know that this is, this is like the height of democratic fashion in Hong Kong. And I think our, our second and next speaker is sporting something along those lines as well. Um, he actually didn't get it in Hong Kong though. He's got a little bit of a story about that. Maybe you can ask him after his speech. He is the head of Asia and Human Rights for the Free from Downward Foundation, uh, running their, their, that department out of their head office in Germany. Uh, I guess he's also the guy to call if you want to build a snowman. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Olaf Kellerhoff. Thank you. saying just in the elevator that I was doing my apprenticeship with one who had to clean the windows because I could do it without the letter while all the other yeah. were as better. So it has definitely also some disadvantage. So take me for your window cleaning or for, for building a snowman. But besides that, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy um, that I be among the group of distinct speakers before and after me to welcome you on behalf of the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom. It's wonderful to be back in Hong Kong, and it is kind of coming home. Why do I say so? I've never been living here, and I just spent a couple of days in here, uh, not more than that. But for me, it's nonetheless coming home, because it's, I'm coming to the liberal family, and uh, which is coming together in this point of time, and in this place, and this is home. Ubi bene, ibi patria, that is a, Latin proverb saying that where it is good, there's my fatherland. So for um, for us here and for me, it is good, and I feel home as we, as liberals, deal with other with respect on equal basis. However, we deal here with inequality, 
globalization has often been identified as a root cause for inner country inequality. We've seen here during the EFN conference so far that we should look more for the inter international inequality as globalization leads to a paradigm shift where nation states become less important on the long run. So globalization leads to the global village, as Marshall McLuhan put it already in the 1960s, when Hong Kong is, all, is there almost already. And we have seen that this process has reduced inequality, in fact, this process of globalization between human beings in many aspects. The same philosopher and media theorist McLuhan is also pretty right when uh, we observe the current global discourse dominated by leftists and Keynesians. McLuhan said, we are driving into the future looking into the rear view mirror. So the remedy for inequality is searched in the past with models which have failed or proved to be wrong. Instead of solution, what we know as liberals will work. Accordingly, let's take this conference as an opportunity. Let's take, uh, let's join hands as only together we can regain control of the steering wheel, smash the rear view mirror and drive without the fear of freedom and without the fear of the unknown, into the future. Currently, Asia has the better precondition for doing that than a struggling Europe just looking into itself. And Asia has a better precondition to prove naysayers wrong once more due to its performance. And Asia has developed, and this I can see in here, and I, by all the interactions with you, and by observing the interactions among you, has developed a liberal family strong enough to set national borders aside and to collaborate for promoting growth and reducing inequality. The Friedrich Hamann Foundation for Freedom is happy and proud to be part of that global family, together with the Economic Freedom Network Asia and the Council of Asian Liberal Democrats. And we are happy to support this process. So let's wish us all a successful conference, not for us and ourselves, but for all those who have to suffer due to those who like to gaze into the mirror. Thank you very much. Bring that microphone down a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you a lot.